Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy February. It is the 1st of February, and you know what that means? <laughs> Why do you say that if it's as if it's so important to me? <laughs> Um, no, it means it's no longer January. Look at your calendars. <laughs> uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, God, for the freedom that you have given us to gather together. Father, in this country, we have such freedom to be able to come to worship to sing, to study your word, to have your word, to fellowship with one another openly. We thank you, Father. But beyond this, we thank you, Father, that the veil is rent. And we have access to the very throne of grace in our time of need. Father, you not only are welcoming us, but Father, you invite us, you command us to come. We thank you, Father, that your presence is here today. According to the promise of your word, you are here with us. I ask God that whatever we do, it would bring glory to your name. It would honor you. You would be lifted up. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we have been working through the fruits of the Spirit. And if you would go ahead and put the definitions up. <clears throat> this is how far we've gotten thus far. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness. And I, I actually missed a little bit of my message last week on goodness. I'm going to cover that today. Just some things that I hope will encourage you. Uh, but we, we've got working definitions. These are things that I've kind of come up with to help me understand when I read these. What, what, what are we talking about here? What does it mean to have love? Well, Steve... Unconditional love generated because the giver has chosen to love, not because of anything the receiver has done. This is the love God has for us. Okay? This is the love he asks us to have for each other. Unconditional. It's not based on whether or not you like the same football team I like. Which is not hard because I don't really care. So that somebody's going to win the Super Bowl today, and I don't care. It's not based on whether or not you do things to bless me or curse me. It's based on the love that God has for me when I was not lovable. Okay? So the love that he has called for us to give out is the love that he gives us. You can picture it like a cup. Your life is a cup. And God pours into your life. And as he pours into your life, it will overflow and flow out to others. That's the kind of love that we need to have. Okay? Peace. Oh, sorry, joy. I, yeah. I, I could have skipped joy. I got little shriveled fruits with joy. Increasingly, not perfectly, right? Yes. Joy. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. Far surpassing happiness. Because it is based on who he is, not what we are going through. It's not based on our circumstances. God is still God, and in his presence is still joy, regardless of whether you're going through a good time or a horrible time. Okay? Life can give you happiness in the moment. It's based on happenings. It's based on happenstance. Joy comes from knowing God and being in his presence, acknowledging his presence. Peace. This is something the world can't give you. Okay? The world can't give you. The world doesn't even understand it. Okay? Again, it's not based on what's going on around you. It's based on who's living in you. The example I gave for this was Jesus asleep in the boat in the midst of the storm. The disciples thought they were going to die. He's, he's resting on a pillow. Absolutely at peace because he knows whose hand is upon him. All right? <clears throat> Patience. Having the ability to avenge yourself, but refraining from doing so. 
somebody does you dirty, you have the ability to get back at them. But this chooses not to. Again, our example is God. Jesus Christ, who came and suffered on our behalf. He did not give us what was required. He could have. What did he tell the apostle in, in the garden? He said, don't you know I could call legions of angels to help me? But then God's will would not be accomplished. Patience. Having the ability to avenge yourself, but choosing not to. Kindness. This is the grace that pervades the whole nature. Mellowing all that would have been harsh or austere. I don't even know how to say that word. Austere? Austere? I've looked it up in two different dictionaries, and it, I don't understand it. It means stern. Okay? So next week, Josh, change that to stern. I can say that. Okay? This is passive. This is how you comport yourself. Okay? This is kind of what you are. You look at jello and what do you see? Jello. And sometimes people put weird things in it. Okay? My, my family put cottage cheese in it. And then they put mayonnaise on top. And I was just gross. <laughs> Nasty. But it's jello. This kindness is what your entire being should be. Okay? The grace that pervades the whole nature, not just here in church where everybody can see. Okay? It's also at home with the people you are most honest and most ugly with. That's where kindness is really put to the test. Goodness. This is character energized. Expressing itself in active goodness. This is an active word. This is doing something. The first one is your nature. The second one is how you act because of that nature. Okay? The example that we gave last week was Jesus cleaning out the temple. Was Jesus being good? Was he showing and exhibiting goodness when he cleansed the temple? Absolutely. 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 Sometimes we need to be whipped to get our attention. I would love it if, if God were able to get my attention just by going, Hey, Glenn. Yes, Father! You need to stop that. Okay. But no. Sometimes it's like this. Hey, Glenn. Hey, Glenn. <laughs> Yes, Father! You need to stop that. Okay! He is good. We have to be good. Good in this tense, in the Greek, this is active. This is action. Okay? Kindness is the mellowing of all the rough edges, smoothing you out. Goodness is acting on the things that God has given you, and He asks you to give the world. All right? There's a couple things I want to wrap up. Goodness. Um, we talked last week how Paul was uh, using this same term. Uh, in Romans 15, 14, he says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. I, I don't like the way they use that word. Instruct is actually, um, it's, a, it's a harder word than just, telling you what to do. The word actually is better translated admonish. Okay? And we talked about the order of that. First you have to have goodness. And then knowledge. Okay? Why goodness before knowledge? Because knowledge by itself puffs up. It makes you proud. <laughs> I got this. God, just you take a break. Yeah, to eat it. I got this. <laughs> All right, goodness first, then knowledge, then we are able to instruct, then we are able to admonish each other, encourage each other, help each other grow. That's what the body is for. Okay, you understand that the body is not for a group of people to share coffee and lectures with, right? 
The body is to be mutually accountable. This is the bride of Christ. That's what we are. All right? We work together, knitted in, woven together to accomplish what God has set before us to do. Nobody can do it on their own. And, and if you know people that have the attitude, oh, I don't need to go to church, it's just me and God. That's not what he says. Read his word. Yeah, there's a personal relationship between you and God, but he has designed it to work that we need each other. When you have a weakness, my strength can help you. When I have a weakness, your strength can help me. We hold each other accountable. We spur one another on to what? Love and good works. Okay? That's why we come together. That's why we have fellowship. And not just here. That's why we're going to go over there. We're going to have fellowship over there. That's why hopefully throughout the week, you have people in this body or outside of this body that you are accountable to, that encourage you, that bless you, that strengthen you, that chastise you or admonish you. Okay? If you all are looking at, for me to do all that, <laughs> you're out of luck. I got your attention for about 45 minutes. Yeah, I know. I speak for almost an hour. You do the math. <laughs> <laughs> so goodness. We have to have goodness first, then knowledge, then we're able to admonish, instruct. Goodness is something that is born inwardly as we continue to walk in God's spirit, but it is enacted outwardly. Okay? So God births it here, and then I carry it out in what I do. I'm reminded of a, a couple of passages uh, James talks about in James chapter 2. You know, you, you know that your brother's in need. He knocks on your door. And he's, I'm cold, I'm hungry. And you go, nah, I'll pray for you, brother. Have a good night. That's not goodness. As a matter of fact, that's missing the entire point of Christianity. Okay? Goodness says, come in. Let me give you shelter. Let me give you food. Even sacrificially doing so. That's the person God blesses. That's goodness in action. Going beyond your comfort zone. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm really comfortable when the plate comes around putting a dollar in. What about when you see the guy broken down on the side of the road and he looks a little shady? Uh, the angels that God's got protecting you are bigger than anything he can deal with. Don't worry about it. All right? Goodness is active. You have to move on it. A couple passages I want to share with you. Proverbs 3.27 Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Now, I I've highlighted two words in this passage here. Can you guess which two they are? Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Somebody take a stab. Do. What? Do. Do. do it. Do it. Now, there are times when you come across things and, and you, you can't do it. You know, you, you, there's somebody, you're confronted with something that you have no power or ability to affect. That's why the body works together. Because you probably know somebody in here that could. When Mackenzie's car was broken, I look at it and I go, yup, it's broken. <laughs> she, she wanted a second opinion. <laughs> well, I called Steve, and he came and looked at it and said, yep, it's broken. But he was able to say what was broken. I just said, oh, well, did, the wheels were supposed to be pointing straight, not in. <laughs> well, I know that much. And Steve gave me all the terms and said, yeah, this is need to be fixed, and this and this and this. And I said, this is, i got to take it to the shop. And he said, yep. So we took it to the shop. See, that's, that's why the body is so important. Okay. Now, you have a problem with your computer? You can come talk to me, and if it's easy, I can fix it. If not, I'll say, hey, Josh. <laughs> Josh knows everything. And he's an intern, so he has to do what I tell him. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He doesn't. He reminds me of that sometimes. OK? 
Okay? Goodness in action. You have to do. All right? Another passage. Galatians 6.10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Okay? So who are we to do good to? Everyone. Everyone. Who do we start with? <coughs> Us. All right? Man, I, I've known people. Have you ever known people that in church, they don't do diddly squat, but man, out in the world, they're doing all kinds of stuff? What is up with that? Conversely, conversely, and we see this more often, people that will bless inside the church and do inside the church, but man, out in the world, you people are going to hell. I ain't wasting my time with you. Ooh. But I, I know people that have that mentality. Doing good doesn't pick and choose. We start here and it spreads outward. Okay? But did, did you notice how he said it? He didn't say be good. He said do good. It's active. One more. <coughs> Hebrews 13. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, there's a couple thoughts here I want to point out. One, do good. Everybody say it with me, please. Do good. Okay, it's active. You've got to do it. Share what you have. You can't share what you don't have. But I'll tell you what, man, we're pretty darn selfish with what we do have. We want to give until we don't want to give anymore. Until we reach that level of discomfort. And some of us, it's pretty small. Some of us, it's pretty big. I, we've got some people in this church that absolutely amaze me with their giving. And I'm, I'm not just talking about financially. Although this church is incredible when it comes to blessing people financially. Incredible. And that speaks very well of the heart of this church. But I mean, man, you have something that needs doing. There is somebody in this church going to jump up and get it done. There is somebody in this church that's going to move. And probably in most cases, there's going to be a lot of somebodies that are going to move. When somebody's sick, we put together, we, we call Kathy, we say, hey, Kathy, so-and-so is going to have a... a this taken care of, what can we do? And man, within an hour, she's got people lined up ready to deliver food. Somebody's going to be out for a while, we got people going to go clean the house. We got people that'll split wood. We got people that'll fix cars. We got, this church is incredible in that way. Amazingly so. The only thing I would say to that is keep on. Don't stop, don't give up, keep going. The second thing I want to point out to you, third thing, excuse me, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, do you see the word sacrifice there? Does that kind of let you know it's not going to be easy all the time? Sometimes it's going to be hard. Do you understand that? Doing good isn't always uh, easy. A lot of times it's very, very difficult. Okay? But that's not an excuse to not do it. Because it's with these sacrifices that God is pleased. Now, I don't know about you guys, but one of my biggest driving things in my life is I want God to be pleased with me. I want Him to look at me and say, you did good, kid. You did a good job. I could trust you with what I gave you. I want him to be confident in me. Now, understanding full well, he gives me everything I need to do to accomplish what he's given me. But I want God to be pleased with me. So do good. Goodness, it's active. It's not passive. It's not passive. Now, not to take anything away from praying for people, absolutely. Somebody comes up to you and has a need and you can't meet that need, Pray for them, but do not use, I'll pray for you as a cop-out. Man, I get so sick of hearing that. Somebody opens their heart and shares with you, and, and you hear, sweetheart, I'm praying for you. My soap's on. Okay, look, if you're going to have the moxie to say, I'm going to pray for you, turn off the TV and pray for them. Lift them up to God. 
Open your ears to God because he might be able to speak to you and show you a way you can help. Or give you the name of someone you can contact to help. And if absolutely nothing else, you got to spend time in the presence of the Almighty God, which is better than any TV show out there. Up to and including Duck Dynasty. <laughs> I have seen one Duck Dynasty in my entire life. And it was funny. Okay. So do good. So this week we were actually supposed to move on to the next one, which is faithfulness. We're not going to do that. Because as I was pondering over my notes a, a little more than a week ago, I was looking over faithfulness and where to go. I was, I was actually very convicted of something that I need to be encouraging to you guys about. <clears throat> you see, it's, looking at this stuff, this can get really weighty. Okay? This can get burdensome, especially if you are trying to do it in your own strength. This can weigh on you. Okay? First... Galatians chapter 5, whose fruit is this? Holy the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's His fruit. How do we get that fruit? By His Holy Spirit living inside of us. Now, that doesn't mean we get to kick back in our lazy boy and just wait for the Spirit to grow fruit in us. So I want to talk to you a little bit today. How do we get the fruit? It's nice to have all the names. It's nice to have the definitions. But how do I do this? Joy? I'm not a joyful person. I don't, don't have a lot of joy. We have a bug -a scale check in our family. And we do this oftentimes several times throughout the day, but every night before we go to bed, we have bug -a scale check and evening prayer requests. Okay? Now we get together as a family, and if people are over, guess what? You're included. And we do a bug -a scale check, and that's from a 0 to a 10. And you, you kind of let everybody know what number you're at, where you're at in the day. Okay? I got all the way up to a 6.5 once. <laughs> everybody fell over. And I dropped me back down to a 5. <laughs> mouth to mouth will do that. You've got three or four people you've got to get mouth to mouth to. Okay? We do this check every night so we know where each person is and we know how to pray for each other. And then we pray as a family before we go to bed, okay? And that lets us know what's going on with each other, where, where are we struggling, what's happening, we can pray for each other. Now, uh, joy for me, I'm usually between a five and a six on good days. Other days, um, Josh and I, we're still debating who's actually been the lowest. And for pride's sake, I'll let him be the lowest. <laughs> you win, Josh. Ha. Gotcha. But five or six is, is really where I kind of live with my joy. Well, you know, you have Mackenzie and Christy who, you know, if they're a six, they're not having a good day. And I look at them going, what is wrong with you? Sevens. They're your seven. Seven point five. There were eights. I can't even rationalize that in my brain. How does it feel to be a seven? I don't even know what eight means. But joy does not come from my ability to appreciate what's going on around me or how it affects me. Joy comes from knowing who lives inside me, from spending time in his presence. So we're going to talk about how do we get this fruit. If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open up. Uh, we're going to go to... Oops, not there. Now, the book of John, chapter 15. <clears throat> John, chapter 15, we're going to start in verse 1. And I'm just going to read this, this first section right here, uh, so bear with me. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the words I have spoken to you. <coughs> Abide in me, and I in you. 
As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. <coughs> As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. There's a lot of abiding going on there, isn't there? <laughs> now, there's a couple of things that I want to point out in this passage. First thing, I love the way Jesus starts us off. He says, I am the true vine. You think, well, why does he have to clarify that? Well, up to this point in Scripture, who has always been addressed as the vine? Anybody know offhand? Israel. Israel. Up to this point, Israel has always been the vine. But Jesus is saying right here, it's not Israel. It's me. Okay? I am the true vine. And if you want to bear fruit, you have to be connected not into Israel, but into me. Now, through Israel came the blessing that pours out to us. Israel is still God's chosen people. Read Romans 11 if you have any doubt about that. Okay? There is a time that they are separated from God. Thank God for that, because without that, we would not be here today. Okay? There will come a time when they will be grafted back in. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 11, it calls us what? The wild branch. Okay? And Paul even goes so far to say, if God can graft a wild branch into the vine, how much more easily do you think he'll graft the natural branch? There will be a time when Israel will be placed back into the vine and they will grow and bear much fruit. Okay? So, first, I love the way he says this. He is the vine. This is where we get all of the things that we're looking for. All of the fruit. All right? So, we've got to be plugged into the vine. This next one, this concerns me. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. If you're professing Christianity and there is no fruit in your life, you're a dead branch. You're dead. What happens to the dead branches? They're lopped off, they're gathered together, and they're burned in the fire. Now there's a couple of different interpretations how this can go. We're not going to get into it. Trust me, you don't want to be a dead branch. Okay? But what about the good branches? Oh, Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So what's he pruning? He's clearing the stuff that's preventing you from having more fruit so you can have more fruit. Oftentimes that's a painful process. Snip, 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 snip. Getting rid of the things that are impeding your relationship with God so that you can have the fruit that he desires in your life. Do you want love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? You want these things? Let God snip away the garbage. Sometimes he takes a little clip here and a little clip there. We go, oh yeah, no big deal. Sometimes he takes a whole branch. But he says that it will bear more fruit. 
So jumping down to verse 4, abide in me and I in you. Do you understand this is a mutual thing? This is relationship. This is the relationship dynamic that God longs to have with us. That we would remain in him and that he would live in us. This is what this is all about. I'm, I'm even going to go so far as to tell you, it's not even about redemption. Redemption is the means whereby we get to this. God put redemption in place so that we could have relationship with him. Redemption was not the end. It was the means that God used to get us to the end. So that we could have relationship. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Okay, this right here, you can get rid of 90% of the books in the self-help section at the bookstore. Bye. Don't need that. No good. We'll just take this whole section. We have all kinds of people going out professing to be experts at how to get you to where you think you want to be. But all they can tell you how to do is act. God can make you something new. God can take the broken pieces of your life and remold them and fashion them into something brand new. He can take the parts that you never thought would ever be healed and he can heal them. He can take the parts that you thought would never work right and he can make them work right. He is the master builder. He created you. He knows you inside and out. He knows what makes you tick and he can take it and make it his very own and make it so that fruit is born out in your life. Because see, everything that those self-help books are trying to do is trying to go from the outside in. And if your heart is not good, you can't make it good. Only God can make it good. In the Old Testament, he tells us that he will take away our hearts of stone and gives us hearts of flesh. And then later he tells us he writes his commands on our hearts. Okay? So put down the self-help books and pick up the self-help book. And find out how God would treat with you. Because if we can really grasp how deep and wide the love of God is for us, why would we want anything more? I don't even want to say anything more. Let's say anything else because there's nothing that's more. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. His banner over me is love. Did anybody else sing that song when they were kids? Come on, did you sing the song? Okay, so some of you picked up what I was talking about. Okay. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him. Again, there's that dynamic of relationship. He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away. Like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Now, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, this, this is one of those passages that prosperity teachers go, Oh, God will give you whatever you want. Garbage. God will give you whatever he wants. Because see, if your word, if his word is living in you and you are abiding in him, he's going to start changing what you want. All of a sudden, that Porsche 959 isn't going to be real high on your priority list. All of a sudden, those things that you really think you want and you're hotly pursuing and passionate about, you're going to find you're not as interested in. Because your satisfaction is going to come from your relationship with him. And when you derive your satisfaction from relationship with him, you're going to be amazed to see the things that he gives you. But he's not going to give them to you if it's going to drive you away from him. God is a jealous God. He doesn't want anything competing with him. Nothing. Not even husband or wife or children. 
He wants to be soul on the throne of your heart. He doesn't want to share it with anything or anybody. Okay? Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. <coughs> How does the world know that we belong to Jesus? Love for each other. Love for each other. And we're going to touch on that in a minute. But we bear the fruit. We bear his fruit. You ever, I mean, we've got a lot of people that have been married for a lot of years. Have you ever noticed how people that have been married for a long time kind of act the same? They, they like finish each other's sentences. Christy does that for me a lot. I'll start to talk and I, 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 get, I don't know what words to use next. And she just finishes it for me. Sometimes I don't even know where to start, so I'll just look at her and she'll just say what I'm thinking. <laughs> and sometimes she says what I'm thinking before I think it. Yeah, yeah, that. We'll go with that. But the same thing is true of relationship with God, relationship with Jesus Christ. The more you press in and the more comfortable and familiar you are with that relationship, the more like him you're going to be. And this is how the world will know that you're his. Because you're like him. The name Christian. Do you guys even understand what that means? It means little Christs. Little imitators of Christ. It was originally given at Antioch as a, a term of derision, of scorn. Oh yeah, you're just like that Jesus fella. Amen to that! The church looked at that and said, Yes! I can think of no finer insult. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. What is this love that we're talking about here? It's agape, agapeo. It's that love. And it's completely based on the giver, not on the receiver. Okay? This is the kind of love you have to have with screaming two-year-olds. And they can do that for hours. <laughs> It's amazing. Now, just, just that. I'm like, I'm done for today. No more wine for me. <clears throat> and they can do that for hours. But I'll tell you what. If God didn't put in the parent's heart an agape love for that child, we would have no children. <laughs> None of y'all, and I know I, would not be here. <laughs> Abide in my love. What better place is there to be? than to rest in his love. Man, when you rest in his love, when you really grasp his love, you're not going to care if the guy honking the horn behind you loves you or not. You're not going to care if that mean, cranky woman at the grocery store loves you or not. You're not going to care how your spouse is treating you because you are content in the love that God has for you. He will heal those wounds. He will minister to those wounds. And he will also chastise your spouse on your behalf. You understand that? Because not only is God love, but he's also our defender. He's the one that protects us. He's the rock on which we stand, safe from all harm. Okay? So abide in his love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's com commandments, and abide in his love. Now, see, this is one of the cool things about Jesus. Hebrews tells us that he didn't suffer anything, any temptation, other than what we suffered. We can't go anything that he didn't already deal with. And he did not sin. Okay? He is a high priest that stands before God, fully understanding, fully sympathizing, fully empathizing with everything we've gone through and are going through. And then he stands before the Father and says, no, I've been there. This one is mine. I shed my blood for this one. As Jesus kept his Father's commands, we are to keep his. Now, I love this one, verse 11. I don't understand it a lot, but I love this verse. 
These things I have spoken to you, everything that we've just talked about right there, remind, remaining in him, abiding in him, that you can have fruit following his commands as he has followed the Father's commands, abiding in his love. These things I have spoken to you, why? That my joy may be in you. See, I don't have to worry about my joy. I got his. I got to figure out how to tap into that to get myself out of the way that that can flow in my life. That my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Overflowing. How are you today, Glenn? Oh, I'm fine. Do you have joy? Yes, can't you see? <laughs> it is overflowing out for me. It is washing all over you. <laughs> What's for lunch? <laughs> joy, joy, joy. I'm happy, happy, happy. <laughs> I have his joy. And that fills me up and flows out of me. But I have one more verse here that I want to encourage you with because we talked about keep my commandments as he has kept the Father's commandments. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? He died on our behalf. Now think about this. This is the sovereign creator of everything that we know. Word tells us that it was by him and for him that everything was created. He made it, and he made it for himself. Okay? And yet he chose to humble himself and come to earth in the form of a man. Fully God, fully man, suffering everything that we suffer, every temptation was laid on him, and he did not sin. He was perfect. He was falsely accused. They lied about him. They could not accept the truth about him. They rejected him. And I, I say they, but really we. Because it was for our sins that all of this was done. They beat him. They scourged him. They whipped him. They mocked him. They insulted him. And they killed him. Now, if that was it, that's still enough. Because he went to the cross in my place, but it didn't stop there. The story doesn't end there. Because three days later, he rose from the dead. God brought him back to life, proving that the cross was sufficient. He is the first fruits of the dead that we might have hope that there will be a resurrection for us. Not hope in, gosh, gee, I hope this happens, but in, I am waiting for the day. Almighty God has done this. But even that, he didn't stop there. He gave his spirit, <laughs> sent his spirit that might live in our lives and birth in us fruit that we might be more like him. More of him, less of me. Hopefully next year, you'll see more of him in my life and less of me in my life. And there will be more of his joy in my life and more of his peace and more of his love and more of everything that he is will be exhibited in my life. Hopefully, I can say the same about you. Trusting that God, who desires and longs for relationship with you, will be able to birth in you fruit like you've never had before. So, <clears throat> abiding in Him. How do we abide in Him? Well, we, you, you got to know Him. you got to have relationship with Him. You have relationship with, with someone, what do you do? You spend time with them. The more time you spend with them, the better the relationship, right? Okay, well, kind of. Well, sometimes you're like, you know what, just get out of my face. I was that way with each one of our children when it was time for them to get out of my bed. Okay, dude, you're 16 years old. Go to the <laughs> right? Really? No, no, no. That's not true. That's not true. Our, our bed was divided up very nicely. The kids got one half, Christy got one half, I got the little line on the side. That's a true story. But see, if God's love is living inside of you, you find yourself refreshed 
and empowered to engage with those people. And I think about this. I, I mean, who wouldn't want to be in a relationship with someone who's perfect? Not just pretending to be perfect, but is perfect. And knows everything you need before you know it. And can minister to your heart before you even know that your heart's hurting. And will never do anything to hurt you, but will only do stuff to grow you, to build you, to increase you. Okay? But you've got to spend time with him. Get in his word. See what he would say to you. Talk to him. Spend time in prayer. And don't just sit there and give him your wish list. Okay? Don't, don't just give him your wish list. Realize that a lot of that stuff on your wish list is not going to draw you any closer to God. It's going to draw you away from him. Lay down your wish list for a while. Lay it down. Take that list, put it to the side. Like in the fireplace. Okay, that's a good place for it. And just spend time with him. And listen. Shut up and listen. Quit talking and hear what he would say to you. So many times when I'm finally able to be quiet, he'll speak to me. Sometimes he'll give me a passage and I open it up and man, it's like he just, he just wrote this letter just for me. Sometimes he just whispers very quietly in my ear. Sometimes I just know. I just know that he's there. Those are sometimes the absolute best relationships where you don't have to talk. You can just sit and enjoy each other's presence. So how do you get this fruit? Abide in him. Remain in him. Stay there. Get there and stay there. Never go back. Always press forward. Press in. Press in. Press in. Press in. Because I guarantee you, the minute you start pressing in, it's going to get hard. Because the enemy does not want you pressing into God. The enemy wants to keep you bound up. Fruitless. He wants to keep you without joy, unable to acknowledge and receive the love that God has for you, unable to share that love with other people. He doesn't want you to have peace. He does not want you to be patient. Okay? He wants to kill you, to steal everything from you, to kill you, and to destroy you in eternity. That's what he wants. So press in, because you don't have to listen to his garbage. God lives inside of you, and he is greater than the devil. And he's given you weapons that are mighty for the tearing down of strongholds. He has fully armed you, and he's planted you firm upon the rock of Jesus Christ that you would not be moved. So stand firm. Now, now that I've said all that, pray for me this week because I'm going to get attacked. I'm not kidding. And I will pray for you because if you start pressing in to do these things, you're going to get attacked. Stand firm. Stand united. Amen? Amen? Father, we bless you today. I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for your heart poured out to us. God poured out to the shedding of blood, to the breaking of your body, to, to death. But Father, your power is such that death could not keep Jesus in the ground. You raised him up from the dead. And Father, he stands at your side and is ever interceding on our behalf. He is the great high priest. All sacrifice for sin is done. The price has been paid. There is nothing owing. God, we thank you for that incredible grace. Father, for your mercy that we don't have to pay for our sin. It's been paid. That you no longer hold against us all of those things that separated us from you. You have made a way for us to come back into relationship with you. Help us, Father, to long for your presence, to dwell in your presence, to put you on the throne of our heart all alone. There would be nothing competing. Help us, Father, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We bless you today, Father. We thank you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.